Okay, in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, some simple examples of Dirichlet series and using them to um, prove some interesting identities. Okay, so first of all, what is a Dirichlet series? So a Dirichlet series, well, I suppose this isn't the most general um, definition of a Dirichlet series, but this is what people usually mean. So if I have a sequence an of um, really any complex numbers indexed from one to infinity, then I can form this sum of an over n to the s. So s is um, this sort of dummy variable, and I can call that a of s. OK, so I take. Uh, these ans to be the coefficients. Um, so this is like a generating function, except instead of a power series, I've got this n to the s instead. And I'll say more about generating functions in another video, or several, because uh, I could talk for days about those. But um, for this video, we're just sticking to these Dirichlet series. So um, these are more generating functions, uh, where you have something like uh, a n x to the n. Sorry, that that's floating in the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> those things are useful for combinatorics and counting, often sometimes number theory. But um, these Dirichlet th series are really uh, fundamental to number theory. So uh, those we're not looking at today. Um, all right, so as a simple, maybe the simplest example, the simplest interesting example, if we take all the ans to be one, we get the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n to the s, which is the Riemann zeta function. So for now, I'm not going to worry too much about the convergence of these series, because uh, that can get a little complicated. Um, so for now, I'm really just interested in what properties these things have and what we can do with the coefficients. Okay, so um, one of the fundamental properties of Dirichlet series is, well, let's take a look at what happens if we multiply two Dirichlet series together. So I'm going to take the sum, I'm going to index them by m and n so that they don't have the same indices. Okay. Now, I want to write it as uh, another Dirichlet series. So I want it to be something times 1 over k to the s. And I have to figure out what that something is. Um, well, let's think about how we can get that. Um, so, well, if k is prime or 1, then I really don't have many options. I have to pick. Um, things that multiply to k in the denominator. So I could do 1 to the s and k to the s here, or k to the s and 1 to the s. Um, but in general, the way I do it is I split up k as a product of two integers, m and n. And then when I multiply these two together, I'm going to get a m b n over m n to the s. And so if I pick m n to be k, I'm going to get the denominator k to the s. OK, so what is the coefficient of 1 over k to the s? Well, I'm summing this thing here over all m and n that multiply to k. OK, so it's a bit messy, but this is what I end up with. Or if you prefer, write as 1 over k to the s times the sum from over just, well, m and n have to be divisors of k. So I can sum over the divisors of k. So that notation means m divides k. Um, and then a m is just a m, and n is k over m. So I'm summing a m b k over m, and m varies over all factors of k. 
Okay, and this thing here is what's known as a Dirichlet convolution. Okay, Dirichlet is the same Dirichlet here um, because he studied lots of um, series like this and he was really one of the first mathematicians to make use of these series to um, solve lots of number theory problems. Um, for example, probably the most well-known uh, example is that he used these sorts of things along with something called Dirichlet characters to prove that uh, any arithmetic progression contains infinitely many primes, uh, as long as the common ratio on the first term are, are relatively prime, so you don't have common factors. So I'll just write that off to the side. So, um, so if you start with two positive integers a and d uh, that are relatively prime, then a, a plus d, a plus 2d, and so on, contains infinitely many things. Okay. And, uh, well, I'm hoping to make a video on that later. Um, not going through the full proof, but just explaining where that sort of thing uh, comes from and what the essential steps are. Okay, so uh, back to this Dirichlet convolution. So convolution is a way of sort of combining two functions. There are other kinds of convolutions, but this is a purely number theory um, way of doing it. So in general, if you have uh, two functions, f and g, uh, that are defined on positive integers, then the Dirichlet convolution is usually written f star g of n. And we take the sum over all divisors of n of f of d g of n over d. Okay, so that's exa exactly what we had here, except uh, the names are a little different. So a is f, b is g, and I'm replacing m with the divisor d. Okay, so why are those important? Well, lots of functions can be written as convolutions. Uh, for example, well, lots of things can be written as a convolution with the function one, that's just one everywhere. So let's look at f, uh, f star one. Well, so now g is just the function one. So I just get the sum of f over d over the divisors of um, f, or sorry, over the divisors of n. And so for example, um, if I want the sum of the divisors, well, then I take f to be the identity function, or if I take f to be the function one, then I get the number of divisors, um, and there are lots of other things I can do with that sort of thing as well. Okay, so um, we've shown that um, multiplication of Dirichlet series corresponds to convolution of the coefficients. Yes. Okay, so these are two fundamental properties that we're going to use um, in just a moment. So but first I want to look at the Riemann zeta function in particular. So remember the Riemann zeta function is the sum, well, I just take all the coefficients to be one. So I get the sum of one over n to the s. So now Euler discovered that this can be written as an infinite product. So how do you do that? Well, so it depends on the unique factorization of positive integers. So if I have, um, say, n equals p1 to the alpha 1, p2 to the alpha 2, up to pk to the alpha k. OK, so I'm looking at the term 1 over p1 to the alpha 1, p2 to the alpha 2, pk to the alpha k, s. OK. Now, remember back when we were doing this convolution thing, we saw that um, when you multiply two Dirichlet series, 
you look at the ways you can uh, have two numbers that multiply to give you the denominator. So let's do a similar thing here. Well, if I just take, um, I can split this up over prime powers. So if I have something with one over P1 to the alpha one, to the S there, and then something with one over P2 to the alpha two S there, and keep going, well, then I'm going to have exactly one way of making one over n to the s um, I split up over the prime powers like this. So Euler's uh, clever idea was to just write out this very thing. So we write out first the powers of 2, so 1 over 2 to the s, 1 over 4 to the s, and then the powers of 3. And the powers of five. And you do that for every single prime. Right, that looks like five to the five, or s to the s. Okay, you do that for every single prime, and then there's exactly one way to make each positive integer. Okay, so this is exactly zeta of s. So I can write it more succinctly as the product over primes p of one plus one over p to the s, plus one over p to the two s, over p to the three s, and so on. Okay, but now this is a geometric series with common ratio one over p to the s. Okay, so the first term is one, and the common ratio is one over p to the s. Okay, so that gives us this infinite product. So zeta is the product of all primes of one over one minus one over p to the s. And this is really, um, at the heart of um, the connection between the zeta function and primes. So this has to do with the Riemann hypothesis and lots of other very uh, complicated connections between the zeta function and primes. Uh, again, that's for another video. Now, okay, so I've got these three facts. I'm going to use uh, these two facts up here and the fact that the zeta function can be written as a product over primes to prove, uh, well, in just a few lines, uh, something called the Mobius inversion formula. Okay, so what is Mobius inversion? Well, the idea is... Um, remember, if I have a function, I can define this capital F to be the sum over divisors of n of little f of n. Okay, so these sorts of things come up all the time. Um, so but rather than starting with little f and finding big F, Mobius inversion allows you to go the other way. So I start with big F and I want to find little f. So I could do this just by writing down a bunch of equations and solving for little f recursively. So for example, plug in n equals one, I get capital F of one equals, well, there's only one term here, it's little f of one. And then f of two, big F of two is little f of one plus little f of two. And big F of three is little f of one plus little f of three, and so on. So I could make it solve for little f one and little f two, and so on. But uh, that's a pain, so let's not do that. Um, instead, we're going to use these fundamental properties of convolutions. Okay, so the idea is I'm going to make two Dirichlet series. So let's say that um, my starting Dirichlet series is little f of n, the sum of little f of n over n to the s. So that's essentially what I'm trying to find. And I'm starting with v of s, which is the sum n equals one of capital F of n over n to the s. Okay, so what's the connection between these? Well, I go back to here. So this is saying, Remember that convolution corresponds to 
uh, multiplication of Dirichlet series. So this whole thing here is one con convoluted convolved <laughs> with uh, F. Okay, so that's saying that um, B of S is the product of the Dirichlet series corresponding to the sequence one, which is exactly the zeta function. And then uh, I multiply that with A of S. Okay, so this way, if I pair up the factors that multiply to, to N, I'm taking, oh, sorry, this should be an F of D. I take F of D from F of D over D to the S here, and then one over um, the other factor I need. Um, okay, so now I just need to find A of S in terms of B of S. Um, so A of S is, I divide both sides by the zeta function. Okay, that's kind of an answer, but we don't really know what one over zeta is. But now let's go back to this infinite product we had. Remember, uh, zeta was the product over primes. of 1 over 1 minus 1 over p to the s. OK, so if I take the reciprocal, uh, I'm just going to get 1 minus 1 over p to the s. OK, now this Dirichlet series is really easy to expand. So if I have, um, well, okay, let me write out the sort of thing I'll get. Um, the coefficients are usually called mu of n, which is called the Mobius function. And I'll say in just a moment what that is. Okay, so how do I compute mu of n? Well, I look at n's prime factorization and see how to get it from here. So if n has any squares or higher powers of a prime in it, um, that's going to give me zero. Because by multiplying this out, all I can ever get is at most one copy of each prime. Okay. And then if n has uh, all distinct prime factors, so no repeated prime factors, then it's minus one to the power of prime factors. Okay. So um, mu of n is defined to be zero if n is divisible by a square uh, and minus one to the number of primes otherwise. Okay, sorry, that's, that's pretty small. So um, yeah, I take the number of prime factors and minus one to that, um, but it's zero if n is divisible by a square. OK, and now this is saying, uh, what's the coefficient of a? It's little f. And here I've got mu, and I'm uh, taking a convolution with capital F of s, capital F of n. OK, so I get this. Or if you want to write it out, it's the sum over divisors of um, mu of d f of n over d. OK, and this is the Mobius inversion formula. And this will come up uh, over and over again if you study number theory. And it will come up in a lot more of our videos.